Well, as the story continues to get more complex and more interesting, it's equally just as scary. Hey guys, camera for Outcast, Season 1, Episode 2, I Remember When She Loved Me. First of all, let me just say, sorry I did not get to review this episode last week. I meant to, it's just there were other things I was reviewing, and for whatever reason, I just didn't get to it. Uh, but I am going to review Episode 2 and then Episode 3 after this. But either way, I was really looking forward to this episode. I love the premiere, I thought it was really different, I thought it was really weird. But like I said, really scary. And this episode continued that. This episode, while it definitely wasn't as big in scope um, as the first episode, there were still some very equally just as creepy scenes in this episode, and I think it's going to be one of those shows where it really does get scarier by the episode, and this episode really just show that, I really did love that, but let's just get into this episode, because overall, I really did enjoy it, um, I thought this was a very good, definitely more of a quieter episode, but I definitely really did like it, you know, especially after episode one, pretty much gave us everything the show had, this episode gave us just as much, but just not as much, you know, violence and things like that, but let's just get into it, because I definitely really did enjoy it, and I love the way the episode started, because this episode, basically, I remember, the reason I think why that is in, um, uh, you know, what, what do you call that? I can't think of what it's called, right? Parentheses. The reason why I think I remembers in parentheses is because it's supposed to be us, you know, seeing these memories. A lot of this episode is seeing these memories, which we start off where we see a flashback of Kyle when he was young and things were much happier. Kyle was outside playing with Sarah, but in the, of course, with his mother. But in the middle, she suddenly, and it was cool to see Sarah, um, actually look somewhat decent. You know, she doesn't just look, um, you know, hideous here. She actually looks like a beautiful mom. And she suddenly saw a demon in her head, collapsed on the ground, started rubbing mud in herself, and this is the day that she became possessed. And you can kind of see why Kyle blames himself for this. The fact that he was playing with his mom, I, you can definitely tell why that's going on. And even though Kyle was so young, we know that he still takes that blame. And in the present, he now suddenly has has running water. I don't know how it happened. He just does. And he's drinking some of it. And Anderson, in the, at the same time this happening, Anderson's getting a service at the church and talks to them about how the church is no longer an option and the only thing that will sustain them from the darkness. And the Anderson we see in this episode is a lot different than the Anderson that we saw in the first episode. And I think this is going to be the Anderson we see throughout the rest of the series because he's now realizing how much more important it is to go to church and how he has a much bigger duty. You know, he's not just there to be this, you know, um, you know, just a preacher that's there to give hope, to, a reverend that's there to give hope to everyone. He you know, the reverend that's there to, you know, give sermons, he's there to give hope. He really is the symbol of hope here, and he really is the one to get everyone through this. Whether he's ready for that or not, I think he kind of knows that here. And he says the only thing that's going to sustain them from the darkness, Kyle is rummaging through the books, and as Anderson tells everyone to be prepared, because the unexpected could be lurking behind the next tree, but there's nothing that really should take them by surprise, because they know it's always there, lurking, ready to seize them in moments of weakness. He says five moments ago, when he woke, he was prepared for another day of God's creation, but by day's end, he was doing battle with a server of Satan himself. Evil carnate, you know, evil of a face that no one would expect. You know, it was, of course, was a child's face talking about Joshua. A face of torment and twisted, sweet innocence corrupted. He tells him about his vomiting and how he was not prepared for it. He let his guard down and evil slipped in. But that's not going to happen now because now he knows, you know, what could happen. And... It's his job to prepare all of them to recognize the dark forces, and that means more butts in the pews because the battle is coming, and unless they're prepared, that darkness will spew forth with the reek of a sewer drowning them in its corruption. They will choke in it, gag in it, and then the black par hell will claim them all. And you can tell it's obviously very startling for them to all hear this, but they need to hear this because that's as bad as things are getting. I mean, things really are a very bad situation. I like that, you know, Anderson, he doesn't really know if he's ready to do this, but I think he pretty much knows he has to move forward, and again, he has to be like, you know, the god of basically there to counsel them all and give them all hope and Anderson thanks them all for coming after the service and Kyle then walks up to him and Mildred gives him this look obviously because you know he hasn't been in church and 
finally, after being in hiding after all this time, he's now in church, and people are really treating Kyle like he's a ghost. Why? Because, I mean, think about it. He was in his house literally for three years, not going anywhere, punishing himself. I mean, he's grown a beard and everything, and now suddenly he has running water. This is the first time in ages where he's actually come to church, and he tells Anderson she's staring at him like he was a ghost. Aaron said that he was gone for a while, but now he's back. That makes him mysterious, and Kyle asked if he told them what happened to Joshua, and Anderson says he couldn't because of how much he was affected him, but he didn't say anything about him, but they need to know the story, and Kyle says, you know, it's not just a story, it's true, and he, you can tell that Kyle, he's a lot more, um, you know, I think he's a lot more, not positive, that's not the word, but he's a lot more ready to conquer these demons, you know, this isn't just him saying, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do this, you know, I'm scared, he's a lot more ready to do that in this episode, and Anderson says, people will tell him the Bible is full of stories, but if people don't believe them, what good are they, and really, he does have a point there, because what good are these stories if they don't really have a point, point? and Kyle asks him if he's sure, if he's sure Joshua's possession is gone for good, because he doesn't really know, and Anderson says they saw the demon leave him, and Kyle Kyle says that, that does, he does remember it happening that way with his mother. I mean, think of the way his mother is. His mother is in this comatose state, and Joshua's not. So he's not really sure if that demon is fully out of Kyle, uh, out of uh, Joshua, not out of Kyle, out of Joshua. And that's a big part of this episode is the fact that Joshua, the way that he, you know the possession ended with him, is a lot different than the way the possession ended with his mom. And he really isn't sure why things happened that way. And I definitely really did like that. I thought that was definitely a very well done scene, and definitely one of the high points of the episode. So Anderson then gets rid of the demon message on his house, and Giles asks where Caleb is, and Anderson says that he had to go over to Wade. Now we see a lot more Giles in this episode. Basically, he said he had to go over to Wayland to save his sister, so he's being handy. And Giles says that he thought he was going to leave it and turn the other cheek. And Aaron says he doesn't mind folks having a bit of fun at his expense. That's the territory. But things have changed, and maybe it's time to start swaying the small stuff. You know, even though it didn't seem like a big deal, now that he's seen what Joshua's been through, it's a lot bigger of a deal to him. And things that didn't seem as big as a deal are a big deal now. And Giles asks if he ever wondered if it's a chicken and an egg scenario. The more he preached Hellfire and Brimstone, the more riled up people get, and Anderson says if he saw what he had, he'd known the people need to be riled up, Giles says he has his back, whether it cost him or not, he knew that, but Kyle has people talking, just from showing his face around there, and really, you can tell that he's really just saying, look, you need to be careful of Kyle, because people obviously don't really respond well to him, they know exactly what happened to him, they know he's been in hiding, and they don't really, you know, Obviously, Kyle's not the reason these demons have returned, but they don't really associate themselves with Kyle because they don't want to be around him, basically. And Aronson says he has a talent. Giles says that's one way to put it and says he knows it hasn't been easy for him, but he's been trouble since he was 10. And Anderson says that they were no better. And really, yeah, you can tell that, they, you know, he says that they were no better. And Giles agrees, but, but Kyle comes from a much darker place. And everyone says he should have been locked up if current events don't change and tells him he hopes he knows what he's doing. And I thought that was a really good scene because, yeah, he does need to be careful of Kyle. Even though Kyle obviously does want to help Anderson, and I think Anderson does want to help him as well, he does need to be careful with how he handles him because Kyle's not in the best situation right now. He's not in the right state of mind, and uh, he really needs to be careful with how he handles him. So I like the way that was done, definitely. So a local then brings a... We get this new plot point here. A local brings a bloody animal to a police station and claims it was one of seven mysteriously hung on a tree, cut like that and nailed like that, and... We don't know what this is about, but there was a tree that was cut and nailed uh, like it was. We don't know um, who did this. Uh, you know, we're thinking it's just an animal, but clearly it has to do with the possession. I think it's really interesting. It really does add here. You know, Mark and Giles go on the case, basically. We'll get to that in a little bit, but Kyle then goes to visit Sarah, tells her about what happened to Joshua, says he thinks he might have saved him, and that Anderson says he saved her too. All but, you know, all, but all he knows is he put there, he put her there and made her like this, and he really doesn't feel like he saved her. I think he kind of feels like he trapped her there, because, again, Joshua, he's free. He gets to be with his mother. He's back to his normal self. Sarah's not in that same circumstance, and he doesn't really understand why things are the way they are. You know, he feels like he didn't really save her, and basically, Anderson says he saved her too, but all he knows, and he basically says after what she did to him, he told himself he wouldn't lose him in his sleep, and thinks back to the time she locked him in the pantry, and of course, you know, we saw in the first episode, which is just as scary here, just knowing she did this, and also seeing that, be and I, I think 
think also no seeing that beautiful um you know picture of her and then seeing that scene of her just playing with her kid and then all of a sudden turning this this hideous demon it's really terrifying to think about i think it's kind of like insidious almost the way they did that i think is really well done and really possessions in general are just terrifying and he asked if she remembers when she used to read him outside the hammock and the bond that they had because they did used to be really close you know they weren't always she wasn't always a demon when when she wasn't a demon they were very close and they kind of lost that and he looks outside he remembers happier times before she was possessed and it's a really nice scene and then he comes back to reality and this gives us one of the most unexpected twists of the episode, but I think such a genius twist as well. Because I did not all think this was going to happen, but he then sees a huge crack in the ceiling, and he walks out, tries to get someone at the receptionist desk, because obviously the conditions are not good. You know, we see that her bed sheet's coming off, there are, you know, watermarks in the ceiling, and he really wants someone to look at that. And you can see that, you know, he's being very, you know, he's obviously very concerned. His concern definitely is shown when he visits the hospital. You know, the, the concern is definitely is there, but they also are kind of taken aback by him because he's being quite, you know, abrupt and he's definitely being quite abrasive towards them and she's, and you know, the nurse trying to tell him that, look, we're going to have mains do it, but you know, you're really not the one that to do this basically, and she says they'll get someone in there as soon as possible. He says it needs to be soon because the ceiling is going to collapse on her. She says she'll make a note about it and he walks out but then turns back and steals and Basically, he decides to turn back, and we don't know what happened, but then all we see is that the wheelchair is gone. I'm thinking, okay, what's happened here? But then we realize what happened when we see Norville. Of course, that neighbor is in his house, and he sees Kyle tied with Sarah's body. He goes to knock on his door. Kyle says that he left the car in the driveway, and Norville asks if everything's okay. Kyle asks if there's something he wants, and Norville says that he's right there across the way, and asks if he minds if he comes in for just a minute so they can talk. Kyle says he's not interested, says he appreciates him letting him borrow his car, you know, basically, um, he says he appreciates him letting him borrow his car, but it doesn't give him the right to come sniffing back there, shuts the door in his face, and we know, obviously, there's a reason why Kyle's doing this, you know, he was acting much more okay with Norva before, and it seemed like he really was open to him, and it seemed like this was someone that could be really close with Kyle, but obviously, he's hiding some. What we find out is not only does he want to help his mother, he stole her from the hospital. He carries Sarah's body, puts her in bed, shuts the curtain so no one looks in and sees her, but also trying to make things as comfortable for her as possible, and I really think the reason that he did did this basically is because he feels by punishing himself because of her not being okay he feels that he's the one that's going to nurse her back to health she he wants her to turn out the way she did you know for joshua and because joshua was able he was able to you know get joshua back to his normal self he wants to get his mother in the same way and he just wants to do the same thing with joshua with his mom and he meanwhile goes to sleep on the couch. It's such a well done scene. I love the way that was done. A very unexpected direction, but a very well done one, and definitely I think one of the best parts of this episode because I really didn't know where it was going. And a lot of people say not a lot happened in this episode. I say really a lot did happen, and that's a very good example of something big that didn't happen. I didn't really see that happening at all. I didn't think anything big was going to happen with that, but I thought it was a very well done scene. You knew that that was obviously going somewhere, but I didn't think that already that was going to happen. But it makes sense why it had to happen because at first I thought it was quick, but later I thought it was a genius move. I really think it was very well done, and definitely one of my favorite parts of the episode, you know, Kyle's endless love for his mother. You definitely do see in this episode. That's something that's shown really well, is that Kyle loves his mother, and he loves who his mother used to be. You know, she used to be this great woman, and he wants her to go back to being the great woman, because she had to be punished from, unfortunately, by this demon, and he doesn't realize why. You know, he feels it's his fault. He wants to be the one to help her, and you definitely see that really here, or, you know, really well done here. really like the way that was done, and definitely, for me, one of the best parts of this episode, without a doubt. So then he goes to his house, he goes to her, and she asks if he was worried she forgot where he lives, and he thanks her for doing that since he couldn't get out, and she's about to go inside, but he tells her that the house is still uh, a bit of a mess. Now, obviously, he's trying to hide the fact that his mother is literally in the bed, and he takes um, a bag from her, she, she says that he's not, he's, you know, um, wearing jeans instead of pajama bottoms, and already, you know, it seems like he's turning things around, you know, he's trying to be a little bit more social, and she said it's a big change, and even though it's a, kind of a small change it's a big change for him you remember how dire things were in the first episode and tells him that she got him spanish blueberries and applesauce she tells him to take it slow he can't go cold turkey off a of captain crunch diet and he asks her for one more favor she says no and he says he's trying to change things and make amends and she says she hopes that's true but he knows she can't and he says it's not like he's gonna ask her to go with her or anything she and holly can do it for him she says no contact covers everything visits cell phones even gifts especially gifts and i guess she's trying to say that even though 
he wants to connect with his family, him not contacting them and not saying anything, that really is, you know, covering up the what he wants to do. You know, that's kind of his, that's kind of, the, there's this wall between him and his family, and that wall is the no contact. The fact that he's not contacting them, you know, he's not going to be able to connect with them, even though he wants to. And, you know, basically it's his, you know, he got a present for his daughter, for his daughter, and... Holly asks Kyle if he's going to the party with them. Kyle asks one more time. She takes the present, plans on giving it to his daughter, tells him to take it slow, and he takes the groceries, heads back into the house, and it's a really nice scene because you can see again that, that you know, concern that Megan really has. She really does want him to get better. She doesn't know the extent of really what he's doing, and she, you know, really just wants him to get back to his normal self. And he makes breakfast for himself, and then remembers the time when he managed to lock his mom in the pantry to stop her from hurting him, because she was at the point where it seemed like she was going to kill him. And he obviously, you know, locked her in the pantry, and a woman then tells Anderson, this woman who we don't get a name from, but Anderson is basically, he's at this, I'd say, like, council is what I'm gonna call it. I don't really know what it's called, but it's all the women that support him, so, like, um... Florence is there, you know, Mildred is there, this woman's there, and then one other girl is there, I can't think of who it is, but basically she tells Anderson that with, um, you know, basically everything's, you know, I guess that he was able to help her garden or whatever, everything's growing better ever since he came out and blessed her garden, so it's only fit that he should come for dinner to taste to, to taste her beet salad for himself, and he says he'd be happy, but his calendar is pretty booked. Florence says the days are pretty tight, but she, but he should be free, free for dinner all week, and it's clear that she kind of does want Anderson to be able to have a life, you know, she wants to have a life, she wants to be with this girl who clearly is interested in him, and the woman says that she was so moved but terrified by his sermon today, and asked what they can do to keep the demons at bay. He says they are they are start by getting more people into the pews. They fill the church to the rafters, and they are his recruiters, his righteous army. The woman says to sign her up. Mildred asks if Kyle is a member of said army, because obviously, you know, he wants to create this army, and if he is the one who put the bruises on Joshua, and he says that there was one enemy in the room, they only want the blood of every Christian soul, Kyle included, spilling into, fe spill into feeding it. Anderson thanks them all for coming, says we'll see them this Sunday, and the woman says that she does hope he agrees to come to dinner and it's a really nice scene. I like the way that it was done. I like that Anderson might actually find love. I didn't think that was actually going to happen, but it kind of seems like in this episode, maybe that's going to happen. Maybe he is going to find someone. Maybe he is going to settle down, and maybe this is going to be a girl that he potentially ends up with. I don't know, but I thought it was a very well done scene. Either way, we like the way that it was done, and I did hear that's the way they're deviating from the comic, and I do like that, because I think for certain shows, you can deviate and take more liberties, and that's something that the show's doing really well. They're expanding some of the characters, and I really do like that. So, Megan, and especially, you know, think of Anderson's life. You know, he is so devoted to religion, he hasn't had any time. This is the only time where he's really going to have free time. I think it's great for him to maybe, you know, have some free time for once. So, Megan and Holly then arrive at Amber's birthday party. Megan decides to leave Kyle's present in the car, because she doesn't really know if she actually wants to give this to them. The fact that Kyle's giving it, you know, she doesn't want to concern, have more problems, but she sees Allison who said it's good to see her. And the way she tried to avoid Allison at first, I thought was interesting. I don't think she's necessarily avoiding her, but she doesn't really know if she's supposed to be there. And basically, she said it's good to see her. She wasn't sure if they'd come up, and Megan says she wasn't entirely sure if they were invited. Allison says they definitely are. As her, she wants a drink. Megan agrees to it, and Giles and Mark are then in the wood investigating what's going on. And these are some of the best scenes the episode with Giles and Mark. I really do love these two working together. Giles says the men said the animal was hanging between the back of his property line and the fire room, which is something he feels Mark should work on learning to read a situation, like the night at the Alston place, and Mark says that he is supposed to keep his mouth shut, follow orders, and says he should have halted Kyle's ass in the night, because again, he still feels that Kyle beat, you know, Joshua for no reason, but of course, Giles says that the mother wouldn't press charges, and Mark says that with all due respect, it's bullshit, battering against the mire, the child should be in protective custody, and Kyle should be behind bars, you know, that's just how it would usually go, obviously, because it's illegal to do that, and Giles asks what he has against he, he, him, he's his brother-in-law, and asks what his wife has to say about it, and Mark says that, you know, his family has nothing to do with it, and Giles says he has everything to do with it, and Mark says that the men beat up a kid, Giles asks if he wants to tell him how to do law, or does he want to learn how to read a map, and assures him it was no ordinary domestic disturbance, and Mark asks if that's because Anderson was there, and if he calls the shots now, Giles says that he keeps the peace in this town in a way that they're called, in the way that their badges and guns can't, and really, that's true. I mean, Anderson's the one that can stop the demons. Anderson's the one that has the exorcism and things like that. And 
Mark Asifi saying that. And also, you know, Anderson can preserve hope. He's the one that gives the hope. They really can't do that. They're just two cops. They can shoot, but they can't really give hope in the way he can. And Mark Asifi saying that because he feels like what he does is for real. Demons and Exorcism. Giles tells him to keep up. I like that Giles is actually ahead of him and that Mark is on a different side. You know, it's not that Mark doesn't believe. He just doesn't have that faith that everyone else has. And Mark is a character that needs to have that faith. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how that goes. And I like that Mark is not just just someone, oh, I don't trust Kyle. There's a reason why. He doesn't trust him because he doesn't have that faith. He doesn't believe in these demons. That's something I'm definitely looking forward to seeing. If he's going to be able to believe in these demons, if they're going to be able to convince him, that's something I think is going to be really cool to see how that's going to go. And I like that he's more than just, you know, a one-dimensional character. I think that's something that I'm really loving about Mark. I think he's a really great character, and they did a lot more within this episode than I ever could have wanted them to. So Kyle's then feeding himself, and he's doing his best to feed Sarah, too. Obviously, it's not working because, you know, she's kind of in a coma's host state, and it's, it's a sad scene, though, because you really do see he wants to help her. He then goes down, washes dishes, looks at the broken locker, remembers when Sarah convinced him to let her out of the pantry, only to realize it was the demon talking, and it's a really devastating scene because Kyle really, you know, just hearing his mother's soothing voice and thinking of the position that he was in at a young age, thinking that his mother was actually there and then realizing it was the demon, really terrifying stuff, and those were by far the creepiest scenes this episode because they came out of nowhere. I mean, all of a sudden you just see him staring at something and boom, there it is. And you're really seeing that this is probably one of the worst things Kyle could have done, bring his mother back. All those haunting memories, you know, all those memories are haunting him now. And this house in general, you know, he's really punishing himself because he remembers, you know, key details from a lot of furniture. Just from looking at like a couch or looking at a door. The way the show is edited like that, I think is so well done. The way he just looks at the door and just looks intently at it and realizes, oh shit, that's actually happened there. It's such a well done scene. I love the way it was done. Really added to how great this episode was. I really did enjoy that. So definitely really good there. Uh, Megan then asks Allison if Amber's still having trouble with the arrangement. Allison says that for the first couple months, she had set three places at dinner. It was easier to just let her be able to uh, sob, scream, and, let her, and just lock herself in the closet. But it's been a lot better lately. She's not having as many outbursts, and the ones she does tend to be aimed at her. And she can't understand why Kyle has to stay away, but it's clearly her fault. And But mostly, they just don't talk about it. And, you know, Allison knows, obviously, that she was the one possessed. We know we we knew that after this so I think Allison knows that this was obviously her fault, but Megan says it isn't healthy for a seven-year-old. She looks outside to see Amber learning how to ride a bike, looks upset knowing what she's been through, and it's a really nice scene. I love the way that was done, and also knowing that there really is no point, for, you know, there really is no version of her life that includes Kyle, and I think Kyle thinks there is, but I think Megan also knows there isn't, and it's really sad to see. So Anderson's with the woman, thanks her for helping him with Operation Butts and Pews. She says it is her duty, but he's going to have a better find a better name. She tells him to come in. He asks if her son is home. She says Aaron is with friends. He won't be home at all. And she shows him a blackberry pie she made her friends. And he won't. And basically says that she's quite the temptress and he can't resist. He then gets a call, and you know it's obviously about Kyle. Just the way he answers about Kyle and what's happened. Tells her he has to leave. Mark then tells Giles that this is the deer trail they've been following. Giles says that they're here since the man says it was the path sh a shag bar following the uh, a shag bark hickory, and the man draws a shitty map and he knows his trees. Mark sees the trees. They see several mutilated raccoons, and Giles says it's a crazy ass trail. Anderson goes to visit Kyle and asks what he's done. Obviously, you know he is really pissed at Kyle because I don't think he's is so much that he's pissed. He's more just concerned and overly concerned. Which is understandable. I mean, what Kyle did is against the law. You can't just steal a body without anyone saying, you know, you checked out. And, uh, you know, obviously she was not legally checked out. And asked him what he's done. She says she's here. Kyle asked him how he knows. He says he, he's listed as Sarah's emergency contact director of facilities. Called him personally and he was not happy. And he asked him what he was thinking. And Kyle says he should see the way they're taking care of her there, and Anderson says it's a serious building, getting by with nurses there around the clock, he can't do it all by himself, and asks what if something happened to him, and Kyle says, and really, I don't think those are things that Kyle did, thought about, you know, he really did this without thinking, I think in his mind, Kyle thought this was a good idea, but really, you know, obviously it wasn't a good idea, because it's not just a good idea to just check your mother out of an institute without, you know, to check your mother out of a hospital without getting permission, obviously, you know, she wasn't cleared, she wasn't ready to get out of there, she's obviously 
Houston on the Comato State, and there were so many things that he did wrong, but I think really he felt he could save her, and Kyle says that he wants things to be like they were, says Joshua is whatever he wants to call it, cleansed, free, and Aaron says he's free of the demon. Kyle says it wasn't like that with his mother. If he got it out of her too, why is she lying like that? Because yes, why is she like this? And Aaron says exorcisms are different depending on the souls they take when the demon went away. It took part of Sarah's soul with it, and Kyle asks what if it's still inside of it? They could drive it out and wake her up, and it's and basically he feels that it is his duty to do this. He's going to be the one to wake her up, and he's going to be the one to fix this. So I thought that was definitely interesting that we got there, but I did think this was a bit rushed. I definitely will say it, but definitely was without a doubt. You know, we're going to get to in a little bit the highlight of this episode. So Giles and Mark continue the trail, which leads them to a banged-up trailer with no one inside. They unlock it. They look inside of it. They're convinced it's just an animal, but then they see these this, like, blood all over the trail, and it really doesn't look like the work of an animal. I think we know it's the work of a demon. Now, what's going on and who's doing this, I can't tell you what's really going on there, but that's overall really compelling. Mark says it might be, and, and, and you can tell that very slowly, Giles is starting to get through to, to Mark. Even though this is only the second episode, Mark is starting to believe what Giles is saying. I definitely really did like that. So Anderson starts an exorcism, tries to release Sarah from the torment of the beast within the destroyer, the receiver, the unholy shall wither and be washed away by the purity and the light of God's love. Kyle remembers back when he thought he saved her and Kyle says that they need more than just words. Kyle goes to, because that's not going to do words, are not the only thing. Kyle goes to the bed and we know, of course, the way he got it out of Joshua was by punching him. Like, holy shit, is he going to punch his mother? That's not what he does, though. Anderson says that she's already free and... Kyle's not convinced, so he says that there's something else. He unwraps his wound. He tries to get the demon out from his blood. Literally squeezes, like, blood droplets into her mouth to get the demon out. And nothing happens, though. They're pretty much convinced, though, that the demon is gone. So nothing happens, unfortunately, which really sucked. But it does make sense why nothing happened, because the demon's out of her. And... Basically, Allison and Megan watch Amber unwrap her gifts. Megan gets worried she took Kyle's presents when a present is there with no card. And obviously, you can just see the look in her face that she knows it's Kyle's gift. And she knows she did actually take it. So, Kyle cleans up his wound. Anderson says the pain hard to give Jesus released by suffering himself. And that's just the way it is. And he makes this point that I really did like. That bringing Sarah there wasn't wrong. Um, God knows that his heart draw him to it. But her son keeping her there isn't right either. Getting all eaten up inside, running at the past... Will eat away whatever future he has in store and that really is true Kyle is trying to make things the way they are and he needs to focus more on what things are now and not how they once were because it's different you know how things are now that's what's important how things once were that's in the past and Kyle needs to realize that you know his mother's in a comatose state and she's not going to be that same woman that she once was unfortunately even though he wants her to be that same woman she just can't be right now and Basically, you know, he says that he says if he wants her to claim his family, he has to let his mother go, but she reluctantly does, and it's a very sad scene. He lets her go, he lets her he lets her back to the hospital, and while there, flashes back to when his mother's finally taken away from him after a violent fight, and he comes home later the night to find a note taken under his doorstep from Megan, who says that Amber loved the gift, and he actually seems satisfied and smiles, knowing that she got it, and also knowing that I think he can't really move, you know, he's he's gonna have to move on. And I love the way this next scene was done. Allison tucks Amber into bed. She looks at what the present is. It's like a book, and she seems, by the look on her face, it seems that she knows who this present is from. Because obviously, you know, it didn't have a sender. It didn't say the who sent it or anything. And she seems to know that it was from Kyle just by the look on her face. I mean, she knew that Kyle did try to call them and didn't say anything, so I'm pretty sure that she's convinced that it definitely is Kyle, and I'm looking forward to seeing when these two are going to meet up, because this episode implies these two are going to meet up very soon. I don't know when, but it definitely does imply that. So a man then goes to see Sarah. Now, who this man is, we don't know, but this guy just comes out of nowhere. Now, we saw him once before in um, Anderson's church, but I didn't really think much about it. I mean, they're closing up in this guy. I'm like, who, why are we seeing him? But then he goes to see Sarah, and... Just by looking at this guy, he doesn't look like good news. I mean, the way he talks, but his appearance alone, he's wearing, like, a suit and, like, this black hat, and he just doesn't look like a good guy. He says, tragic to see her like this. She had so much fire in her and sad that her son will never know how much she fought back and resisted, and despite it all, they have him anyway. He puts in, he, they have him anyway. He puts in his hat and leaves, and 
I'm going to show right now that this man is single-handedly the reason why she is in the States and why this stuff is happening to Kyle. He is the reason for all of this. Now, who he is, I'm going to say he's the devil. I don't really know. I mean, I, I'm guessing he's a demon of some sort, but right now he kind of seems like the devil just by the way he talks, and I don't know if the show is really going in that direction. I think he's going to be his own character, but for right now, he does seem like the devil. So a single tear rolls down Sarah's face, and we realize that she's not in a coma. She's in some sort of, like, conscious coma that she's not going to be able to come out of. Now, how she's in this, we don't know, but clearly she is alive. It's just her body is kind of frozen right now, which we don't really know how this happened. That's something I'm looking forward to. But then we get a very important scene at the end of this episode. I'm assuming every episode is going to end with a flashback, and basically we see what happened when Sarah got the demon out of her. The demon got out of her, wrapped itself around Kyle, knocked him out, which he does not remember at all, as Anderson banged the door that day. That is how the episode ends, a perfect way to end things overall, and now let's get to this episode. So like I said, not as big as the first episode, just in terms of scares and things like that and scenes. Not Definitely not as eventful, but equally just as satisfying. I mean, there were some really great scenes here. The fact that Kyle blamed himself for his mother's death and now knowing all this stuff that happened. Who is this man? You know, I really feel that he is responsible for the, you know, Barnes's misery. He is the one responsible for this. Now, we don't know who he is or why he's there, what he has to do with anything, but definitely he is responsible for what's going on. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what's going to happen with that. You know, what's going on with this man? You know, what's going on with this man? Who is he? I'm going to say he's the devil right now. We don't really know why he's there, if he's causing everything that's going on, or if it's just for Sarah. We're not really sure. That's going to be interesting as well. Kyle has no memory of what happened to him with the demon, and I think that's the reason why... Kyle's put through this pain. I'm not really sure. I think that overall is really interesting. Now, the man could very well be that demon in human form, because I'm pretty sure that demon can take hold of anyone. I feel like that's really what it is. It may be that demon is him in human form. I'm not really sure. I think that's interesting. Um... We'll have to see what's going on there. Now, as far as Allison goes, this episode heavily implies that Allison and Kyle at some point are going to meet up. And these two, they're going to meet up. They're going to have some sort of confrontation. I think that's going to be very soon. Now, when that's going to be, I don't really know. That's going to be interesting as well. Um, I like the scenes with Allison and Megan. I like the way these two bonded. I like that Megan now knows more what's going on. It seems that both Allison and Giles, they both kind of convinced Mark and Megan that there is more going on than they think. Because as we know, Mark is Megan convinced that there is no demon and that none of that stuff is going on, that anything that Kyle says is not true, and that it's crazy. I mean, I get it that it's hard to believe, but obviously it's going on. They can't pretend it's not going on, because it is going on, and you know, the fact that they don't think anything's going on, it is something is going on, I think they are kind of convincing them there's more going on there. What is up with that trailer? What happened there? That's something else I'm definitely interested in seeing. And then Anderson and this woman, do they have a future together? I don't really know. Who is this woman? Does he have a future with her? We didn't get a name right now. I'm looking forward to seeing really what's going on there. Is Anderson going to be able to get more people? Is he going to get more people to be aware? It looks like in the next episode, there's going to be another victim, um who's possessed. I'm hoping this show isn't just one possession of the week. I'm hoping these all connect in some way, which I feel like they do, and basically the founder of all that is that man. We'll have to see what's going on there. But over, guys, I'm you guys saw this episode. Love to your thoughts on it. We'll see you guys in my next which will be for episode 3 of Outcast. Really loving this show so far, and we'll see you guys for that. Okay, bye.